Welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. We are here on a bright Saturday evening with Dr. Roop Gursahani and Dr. Raja Bayer. Those of you who've been to our health webinars in the past uh, have met with Dr. Bayer already. The topic for today is palliative care for neurological conditions. Now, those you know, people are familiar with what palliative care is, but uh, uh, just very briefly, palliative care is care for the terminally ill and their families, especially that is provided by an organized health service, hospital, or medical practitioner. So uh, Dr. Raja Mayer, who's a leading uh, palliative care specialist and a well-known respiratory surgeon attached to the Hinduja and Bhatia hospitals of Mumbai, is anchoring this series of very informative sessions for seniors today, uh, Health Life series. And Dr. Roop Gursani is a consultant neurologist and, a, and an epileptologist at the PD Hinduja National Hospital Mahim and the Hinduja Hospital, Hinduja Health Surgical at Khar in Mumbai. He's trained at GMC Nagpur and GMC and Sir JJ Hospital in Mumbai. So welcome both of, uh, Dr. Ayer Thank as you. well as Dr. Gosani. Thank you for being here on a Saturday evening. And uh, <clears throat> how has it been for your uh, vaccinations? I'm sure... You must have had uh, both your vaccinations and... Uh, None. Yes, and I hope all the viewers also who are probably yeah. 60 plus are on the road to both be, all be saying done. So we hope to have all the senior citizens vaccinated soon by this month or next month end. And tell yeah. me, uh, uh, so this entire issue, I, I know we are, we are discussing neurological issues, but this whole thing of COVID shield versus co-vaccine, is that an issue at all or is that... Uh, something that one shouldn't really be worried about? I, I don't think so. For one thing, uh, uh, I don't know if you've realized, but uh, Covishield uh, has got uh, clearance, I mean, uh, clearance again from the Europe uh, European That's regulator. Right. That's right. So I think uh, just go ahead and take it. Uh, when there's such a large number of uh, this going on across the world, remember you are injecting not babies, Babies are very healthy. You can do anything to them. Older people, as it is, are a little vulnerable. So there have been incidents, and I think uh, whoever has looked at it is very clear that they are unrelated. So just go ahead and take it. You know, one of the jokes doing the rounds on, on the on the WhatsApp circuit is that all the doctors have taken their uh, have yeah. taken the vaccination. So you know, you may as well do it because you know. if you fall sick, there's going to be no doctors available. If you think that the doctors are going to die of the vaccine. Well, if, if that is a fear, if that is a fear, and, and you know, I must confess that that there is such a fear that has been created for whatever reason. So, you know, the very fact that all of you have have gone ahead and done both of both your, you know, uh, uh, taken both the shots, and y'all are here and y'all are you know uh, uh, doing fairly well. So, uh, so great. So, I I I'm going to come to you, uh, Doctor Ayer, you know about. Uh, palliative care and we uh, when we met with you a few months back we looked at palliative care for uh, in general as an issue and specifically for people with uh, respiratory disorders and uh, what we did decide was that look at on an every other month kind of a basis look at various other uh, uh, health conditions and I think it was you know great that we could get uh, uh, Dr. Rup Gursani here, because one of the areas that is uh, is huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, is a huge matter of concern for senior citizens and their families are, are neurological conditions. You know, whether it is stroke, whether it is dementia, whether it is uh, Parkinson's disease, so the, the 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 whole issues are are huge. So let me let me do one thing. Let me. You know, in, in, in terms of the format of this uh, uh, of this health webinar session, you know, uh, uh, let me ask you this question about, you know, in, in terms of palliative care, how how high is uh, is uh, the entire neurological you know ailments versus the various others? If there is uh, anything in terms of in terms of the need for care, in terms of the information that is there. Uh, where does that stand? And then, you know, what I would uh, uh, request is if you and Dr. Gursani can have a discussion, which 
all of us will uh, uh, will listen in and then of course we will ask questions to uh, uh, dr gulsani which, which a lot of our people have sent sure so, thank you so much pradyuman and thank you seniors today for giving us a chance to connect back with the seniors of india today and just to remind you uh, last time i think when we spoke with dr sujit rajan we kind of reminded all of you that to, india is slowly becoming a graying nation and by 2050 there'll be a sharp rise in both 60 and 80 year olds it's also very evident in literature that about the age of 65 patients usually suffer from one or two if not more chronic illnesses of which neurological conditions is definitely high on the cards for senior citizens the other important thing we discussed last time where we left off was the importance for senior citizens to be aware of their medical conditions to take part in their decision making about medical ethics regarding autonomy and to focus on quality of life and person centered care so with that i'm glad that we are continuing the series with uh, neurological conditions in specific because like i said before there are more conditions which can affect the senior population amongst that when you talk about palliative care pradyuman again i wanted to just correct you in that sense saying we focus on palliative care as not just end of life end of life and terminal care is a part of palliative care what we in palliative care want to do is make the journey comfortable so from the diagnosis to the end of life mm. and also address health related suffering not just for the patients but also for the families and in that sense neurological conditions really play a big big important role because these conditions affect patients for a long period of time they live with a high symptom burden for a prolonged period of time and the suffering that the patient and the family undergo is not just physical it's emotional psychological social and in our country financial therefore i'm really glad to have dr roop here who's not only been my teacher in grant medical college and now suddenly the uh, you know the age gap has disappeared and we are colleagues in hinduja and we work together looking after a lot of patients well he still sir to me at times so i'm really glad that roop is here and what i would really like to start asking him is what are the conditions in his uh, you know experience and Uh, you know duration of practice that he sees commonly in the elders and what in those conditions are ch- have been challenging to him the patients and the relatives uh, over to you roop okay um am i audible yes so now just a quick uh, um, addition to what uh, dr rajam said and uh, uh, and that is about palliative care it's it's something that is a little difficult to understand and i'm going to take a little a minute to explain it to you because frankly both rajam and i need you to explain it to your doctors okay because doctors don't get it really now as specialties uh, evolve like you look at my own neurology specialty if you see the uh, if you see my Uh, what i do i have added epileptologist also to it okay so neurologists become more and more specialized they do they do something called movement disorders or they become specially specialists in stroke and they are called strokeologists and so on yeah so we get more and more specialized until you hear that old joke of the ent surgeon who is a specialist of the right ear and the one who is a specialist of the left ear but when you look at seriously ill patients not terminal seriously ill patients you realize that suffering in them uh, in terms of physical suffering psychosocial suffering spiritual suffering the suffering of the family the whole ecosystem around them who looks at it now uh, in a sense earlier the family physicians perhaps used to do it but you know what this whole business of getting old and dying has become so complicated that family physicians really can't you have you need special training to be able to do this and for those of us who are interested in palliative care we realize that this becomes a specialty that sits on top of the other specialties uh, i wouldn't say on top but kind of takes 
care of patients across specialties, but patients who are seriously ill, where you accept that cure is no longer possible and you are focusing on care. And now you would say, ye kaun si nahi baat hai? doctors are supposed to care. No, unfortunately, doctors are not trained to care. They are trained to cure. And when they can't cure, they are very liable to put on their parachutes and jump off. Okay, so you need people who are trained in palliative care and who can take on from the point where cure becomes no longer possible. Now, in a neurological condition, there are there may be many years, many years between diagnosis and the point that it becomes really obvious that cure is not possible. And many more years beyond that before the person eventually does pass away. So we now look on palliative care skills as coming in at the point of diagnosis and then carrying on, taking on more and more of a role in managing the patient and the patient's ecosystem until the end and perhaps even after that. Because the palliative care physician is responsible for the family. So the palliative care physician actually is supposed to monitor bereavement and recovery from grief up to a year after the patient has passed off. You know, uh, so as, as, as we have, uh, I think Dr. Ayer is having an issue once again. Oh, you I'm know. fine. I'm right here. Okay. So I, I, I think want to ask yeah. this question. Sorry. Sorry to... Sure, yeah. sure. No, no. So, go ahead. The whole thing about, about the need for doctors to be trained and uh -huh. what you said about care and cure. Now, why is it, you know, and I'm going to ask you both this question, is that why is it that, you know, that exists? Because at the end of the day, when a patient goes to a doctor, you know, you are, you're, you're there for the cure as well as the care and also advice. So, you know, what you're basically saying is that, and, and you, you know, you, you mentioned in the beginning that we want you to tell the doctor you know, about palliative care and in a sense, explain to the doctor. So that's a, that's a genuine worry in, 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 in cases like these, in cases like neurological concerns. Okay. So you see what happens is, uh, Rajam asked me a question about what conditions would be okay. really, would I really be seeing? So uh, patients who have paralytic strokes, especially when they recur and kind of make people gradually deteriorate. Uh, Parkinsonism, Dementia, dementia, above, above all, because dementia is, is something, I mean, uh, my joke about dementia is that either you're going to uh, die before you get demented or get demented before you die. You have no other choice. So please, <laughs> all of us have to remember that. <laughs> then, of course, you have people who develop, uh, who even earlier in life have very bad uh, brain injuries of various kinds, including head injury. Then you have people who have cancers of the nervous system or cancers from outside the nervous system spreading in. And uh, 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 you even have people who have bad spinal cord uh, injury and so on. That there's, so there's actually, if you look at it, um, although palliative care began with uh, cancer, it's now beginning to be realized that uh, when... Uh, palliative care is freely available or when the community makes a choice to enlist somebody for palliative care. And we see this happening in Kerala. 50% uh, of the work of the palliative care teams is neurologic. Uh, sorry, um, you, you asked me something about why doctors don't get it. Oh, okay. So there is a little bit of history here. Somewhere in the late 1950s, medicine really began to advance. It advanced so much. So at, before that, a doctor had three jobs. A doctor had to make a diagnosis, to give treatment, and to tell the patient what lies ahead. Patient and the family, ki ab kya hoga? Okay, diagnosis improved, but treatment improved even more. Even in my specialty, when I joined, uh, my colleagues used to laugh at us. Neurologist banega kya treatment karne wala hai? Your patients are not going to improve. And now we know that's not true. There are, there's a huge amount of treatments that are possible. So as diagnosis and treatment improved, 
prognosis gradually dwindled. So doctors lost the skill and the art of figuring out what lay ahead. Basically, of foreseeing and foretelling. And I, I have this. Uh, this is a kind of an insight which I'm not very sure is uh, is quantified. That because we lost or we were never trained in the ability to foretell. You know, because we were not trained in the ability to foretell, we consciously closed down our foresight. Batani sakte to dekhe kya fayda. For various reasons. So it has become, both things have gone down. Together with that, as you stop seeing what lies ahead, you stop being able to uh, predict and plan for an inevitable future. And if you are not trained in palliative care or in the basic, uh, uh, I, would, I would call it the science of palliative medicine, then you get very uncomfortable at this stage. You get really, really uncomfortable. I know that for me, so very often, it, it would choke my throat to say, Ab main kuch nahi kar sakta. Now I don't have to say it because, well, like Rajam, we, we are trained in palliative care. Um, I never know. I no longer ever say, Ab main kuch nahi kar sakta. I say, main hoon. Great. Main hoon. I mean, aakhir tak hoon. Over to you, Rajam. Please go ahead with your discussion. So, I mean, yeah, so I basically, I also wanted to say palliative care is probably medicine's best kept secret. And Roop, you did mention about the challenging situations that you see are probably the strokes, uh, Parkinsonism and dementia. So what I wanted to know is, tell me how the training in palliative care and the fact that you now are trained in palliative care, how has it changed your uh, perception of treating these patients? Like you said, from to Mehuna, that transition, how has that happened and how do you think adding value to it? And uh, an addendum to that question would be, if you could just describe us how a patient's journey has been affected positively with the influence of palliative. In my own personal experience, uh, yeah, so... Um, one of the most challenging for a neurologist is something called motor neuron disease. Uh, motor neuron disease or uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Some of you may have heard of it from the ice, buck cha ice bucket challenge uh, events that went on when they raised a lot of money for ALS research. A ALS is a condition where it's quite rare. So I have not included in the list that I spoke about earlier. But it is a disease in which the muscles gradually waste away. And uh, uh, from diagnosis to death can be as short as uh, two years or even three years. And uh, uh, in fact, in neurology, it is probably the condition where we come closest to, say, dealing with situations like cancer, where once, uh, say, for instance, the cancer uh, rampages and is no longer controlled by chemotherapy or anything. Then you have, uh, well, you are basically providing only care. So in motor neuron disease, uh, you have to take the patient and the family through diagnosis. When you make a diagnosis like this, you actually are, uh, uh, in some ways, gently as it is, but telling them that uh, uh, you're that it is not going to end well. Uh, it's literally a death sentence. And then you have to also handhold the patient through the and the family through the deterioration that follows. Now, uh, because of my training and my reorientation, I no longer feel uncomfortable about doing it. It's it's part of my duty. It's a privilege to be able to. Now share the journey with uh, people who actually are being very, very brave. And uh, to me, that is the, uh, how can I put it? It's part of the, uh, my pride in being a doctor, that I can actually do this. So to my message to uh, those of my colleagues who don't still get it, of what palliative care does is that I think that Everybody needs a basic 
skill set in this uh, as it is happening it's now um, in the government of india the uh, uh, medical council they've now introduced something called the eightcom module which is now supposed to be taught from the first year onwards formally so that uh, by the time our uh, uh, young kids come out at their mbbs level they will have been oriented towards it but for the seniors who never really been exposed to this kind of thinking it's uh, not very easy very often when we suggest the term palliative care to them uh, they make the same mistake that pradyum did and that was think of it as end of life care or terminal care no that is not it the ability or the orientation that i have allows me to break the diagnosis to the patient in such a way that the patient for instance i mean we've heard stories of this where when the diagnosis of motor neuron disease was given the patient went and committed suicide the next day so obviously you have to convey a bad diagnosis and you have to help the patient the family through whatever is there so that is something that i think is 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 what every doctor should be able to do right uh, dr gosani i uh, you know rajam has had uh, a bad connectivity so i'm going to ask you for you know when she is coming back but in in the meantime could you talk to us about a few cases uh, that uh, uh, you know some case where you have looked at how palliative care good palliative care uh, has actually helped a, a, a patient and the family uh, in in their journey you know with with a neurological condition um uh, okay so for instance in people with uh, dementia if you look at somebody who is uh, who's got uh, alzheimer's disease and this has been going on for uh, some time as uh, the journey progresses uh, people get uh, they lose more and more of their cerebral functions and as they lose cerebral functions they start to find it they they speak less they move less and eventually swallowing goes down and how do you make them comfortable at the end so uh, typically uh, one of the things that we help families understand and this is something that doctors often do, don't realize is that these are patients where uh, putting in a feeding tube or putting the patient in the icu is is probably the worst thing you can do you know because uh, this is somebody who's transiting life in reverse and is going from literally from being a a, a small child to to an infantile stage and you don't put an infant on the ventilator when you know it's going to end the other way because uh, it's it's torture so that's where it's important for me to be there to handhold the family in making these decisions similarly the same thing can occur in parkinsonism too uh, the same thing can occur in people who had very bad strokes towards uh, uh, the end of life and at the end of life uh, if somebody has i mean sorry i mean end of life of course is something that you know a little later but somebody who comes in with an extremely i mean a bad stroke from which they are not expected to have uh, a decent quality of life and they are already very old again it uh, helping the family make decisions uh, for instance to not uh, put in uh, a tube here and put them on a ventilator indefinitely and to manage the end without any uh, distress to see that the uh, patient doesn't suffer struggle for breath and that the passing is peaceful and also to make the family understand that this is not their decision it is a medical decision so that you know very often uh, uh, you are faced with the situation where the family is told ki aap decide kariye no that is not right these are medical decisions that we are supposed to take and not put the burden on the family so these are various situations that we come in in, uh, in neurology practice where we need to uh, have some amount of practical training uh, as to particular cases i think i'm a little uncomfortable about 
Oh, that's right. That's discussing right. individual right. cases. So you know, I, I, I'm just looking at you know ways and means in which palliative care can be a can be in a sense a healer. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ayer is having a bit of an issue connecting back, but I, I'm going to you know come to you with a question that somebody has said. Sure, uh, I think that's better. 75 plus elderly who are living alone and so far okay. Uh, but deterioration of health and movement limitations, what can they do to manage themselves? Uh, you know, the person is looking for medical advice like supplement and diet to take. Yeah, so one thing is that uh, uh, age is, is inevitable, but it's also just a number. It really depends on how well you take care of yourself. And probably, uh, you know, over this period of time, we realize that the... It's the simplest answers that are the best. And the most important is exercise. Uh, even for dementia, it's been realized that uh, the brain circuitry that underlies walking is the same brain circuitry that is used for memory and thinking. So if you can walk briskly 30 minutes twice a day, you are good. And of course, uh, if you can get more physical exercise, um, uh, there's no restriction on, for instance, un under supervision in doing uh, even weights, um, yoga, tai chi. All of these help. So physical exercise is number one, by far and above the best way of uh, keeping things going. In terms of the rest of lifestyle, yes, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, try and keep your weight down. Uh, see that uh, you avoid smoking alcohol uh, within limits, uh, have a positive attitude, but then you'll see that all of these things kind of go together. In terms of medical attention, yeah, I think you need to have touch base or be accessible to a good uh, general physician or a family physician in your neighborhood who knows your conditions, your health and so on. And also uh, see that you uh, keep getting regular checkups. I'm not saying that you need to be at your doctor's clinic every month. But I think once in about six months, touching base with your doctor, sorting out issues, getting a preventive checkup done, those are important things. But I think the most important is that you need to have uh, access to a doctor or a treating team that knows your, you and your condition. Uh, we, we, are we going to discuss uh, the living will a little further ahead, Pradeep? Or uh, you want me to touch we, on we it? Could, we could, you, could, you could discuss that and then I'll get to the next question. Okay. So the last thing that I want to mention is that uh, you, you probably guess by now what I think of uh, uh, people at the end of life ending up on ventilators. And uh, uh, you know what? Uh, even now, as a doctor, I know that if a patient comes in to our ICU, we know that the person is at the end of life. But if we do not know what that person's wishes are, the family doesn't know what their wishes are, then we are duty-bound to do everything. And sometimes everything is not what you want to do. Right? So how does this work? You need to put these directions down on paper. But more importantly... Um, in India, as of now, most of us still have family. We still have social connections. You have to identify at least three people. Put them in sequence. One, two, three. Depending on access. And also depending on whether they are willing to support you. They have to be there at that time to be able to guide the doctors and tell them this is what she wanted. This is what she did not want. Right? So you need to document your wishes and you need to identify people who will see that your wishes are carried out. And we say that at least three people because you can't always have, uh, number one may not be there. So then number two, then number three. This is not a committee. They're not, I mean, they can talk to each other, but this is not a committee. The, the authority is clearly one, two, three. Right? So this is the, the, the wishes part of it is called the living will. The people who you identify are called healthcare proxies, 
and the whole thing coming together is called the advanced medical directive great thank you uh, we have a question from uh, two questions that have come in just now uh, one from mr bridge dukal who ask is there a book on this subject for the family i i presume that you know he is looking for a book on uh, palliative care for neurological conditions is there some book that you would recommend um i think uh, no it's uh, there 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 are, there are lots of uh, disease specific books uh, for dementia the one that i recommend and that perhaps is probably the broadest is it's called the 36 hr day it's available on amazon it's come out in multiple editions the 36 hr day the family care givers guide for somebody with dementia um then uh, uh, but if you look around i'm sure there are uh, uh, enough there's enough literature available on i've shared some uh, patient information stuff uh, with pradyuman so i think you can pass it out to anybody who requests it uh, i'm not sure it's it's from up to date so i'm not sure if it is copyrighted or whatever yeah 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 i am uh, sorry one second i'm just passing on a link to dr ayer so uh, yeah we have a question that has come in from uh, uh, mr zavey choudhry he asked does a living will have to be registered okay so a living will is uh, different from an estate will uh, uh, worldwide it needs uh two witnesses in some places in fact it's only one witness but generally the trend is two witnesses and uh, at the most elsewhere in the world it needs to be noto- notarized in india because we are at a transitional stage uh two years ago uh, sorry in, in uh, three years ago sorry march 2018 we actually it was uh, constitutionally declared as valid before that um it was not really valid you you uh, you really didn't have uh, i mean independence in your personal medical sphere so it became constitutionally valid in uh, march 2018 uh, but the supreme court placed restrictions uh, on how it could be made uh, enforceable and for that they required it to be signed off i mean or at least counter signed by a judicial magistrate first class now i always tell people that enforceable is legally enforceable but enforceable is also morally enforceable yeah so if your family is aware of it if that document is there and if they know what has to be done then to my mind it is enforceable in, in 95% of cases there will be a family member standing with that so it's only in situations in countries where there's nobody that you need a legally enforceable document right for 95% of us a morally enforceable document should be more than enough so i suggest to all of you if anybody really wants to do it i mean obviously you can go and try getting it countersigned by the judicial magistrate first class uh, we have tried it and we have uh, found out that the gmfc usually says sorry mere ko malum nahi iske bare mein really teen saal baad <laughs> so that's a bit of a joke but anyway that's right we have a question from a, a very important question uh, uh jazat kapadia who asks how do i know which doctors in my vicinity are capable enough to advise me on palliative care ask ask them <laughs> how do, how does he know how does you know i uh, it's not it's unfortunately if you go around looking for palliative care doctors there are exactly 200 in the whole of the country really but if a doctor says yes i do understand what palliative care is and i yeah i have done a little bit of training in it that's good enough but if the doctor says palliative medicine palliative care वो तुम्हारे को उसकी कोई जरूरत नहीं यार अभी बहुत टाइम है तुम्हारे को उसकी सो देन यू नो दैट ही डजंट गेट इट और शी डजंट गेट इट राइट एंड 
the news of the day is that Dr. Ayer is back. <laughs> and I'm very sorry for this meeting. That's okay. I, I, Rajam, I'm sure I'm enjoying I, my own voice so much. I can imagine. And I know that Roop can carry not just one, but many sessions and patients on his shoulders. So that I'm not worried about at all. So anyway, I have missed most of this, but I know I've heard all of this before. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are enough questions to keep you and Roop busy. No, so I, I'll tell you what, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, sorry, Raghav. You know, yeah. one, one is, of course, asking us, can you share a typical draft copy of a living will? So I, I okay. tell you what, I think I'm going to address this question. I think it's an important thing. We've had this discussion. Today, you've spoken about it. Uh, in the past, uh, Rajam has spoken about it. So we will perhaps do it in the magazine and, you know, we'll get into, I, I will discuss it with you and then look at that and look at also speaking to uh, some legal eagles to figure what can be done. Uh, we have a question from uh, Zaveh Chaudhary who asks, we went through this with my dad with Louis body dementia. How can we keep the patient comfortable without extreme measures once they are sent home? We were very scared how we could manage him once we took him home. Um, yeah, so uh, ideally there's a whole bunch of measures that uh, one is supposed to focus on. It's not just uh, a simple uh, one-step thing. Um, Rajam, would you want to take on from this? I mean, yeah. uh, so if you want to take care of us. Yeah, so what usually happens is, again, few uh, when the neurologist actually uh, calls upon palliative care to help at this stage, I think the first thing is to understand what the patient and the family needs are. I think the needs for every family is different. It starts from whether they can cope looking after that patient at home, whether they have the wherewithal to look at it, you know, in terms of size of the house, in terms of hiring help, even if it's unskilled help. So a lot of detailing goes into how safe and how easy it is for the patient and the family to look after the patients physically. Then, of course, to see the family dynamics as which wherein the GP and the family physician plays a big role. So before Dr. Roop actually discharges the patient, we, I, we, I see to it that I connect with the family GP. The family GP is bought on, uh, got on board and explain the situation, explain the futility of intensive aggressive treatment and the goals of care, which has been decided as a common meeting between the family, the neurologist and me, and that is explained to the uh, G family GP. The next thing the family GP is given is a whole algorithm of how to control difficult symptoms that may arise to so basically empower him with the knowledge that what, if this happens, what you need to do, when do you need to contact us? When do you need to get to the hospital? So it's not that we want patients to be always at home. If the family is not coping, Yes, they can come to hospital, but at the same time in the hospital, they make it very clear, no aggressive treatment. So a lot of handholding goes. There is a constant communication or a WhatsApp group. In fact, now that I make between GP, family, kids abroad, if they are abroad and me to get a weekly progress or if they have got stuck somewhere, how to help them overcome that. Plus, if you realize the caregivers go through a lot of emotional uh, roller coasters during this time, they also need the support. So whether they need counseling support, whether they need a respite care. So all those issues are discussed, how to rotate the siblings or if necessary, the patient be admitted somewhere else, four day gap, five day gap. So each, each um, what do you say, treatment is tailored depending on the needs of that particular patient and how uh, the family is coping, how big is the family, because sometimes it could be just one caregiver, the rest of the siblings are away, either they can, they used to in the pre-COVID, you know, rotate, there used to be sons and daughters who could come and fill in and give this son and daughter some respite, that is also not happening during the COVID, so a lot of hand holding, the family physician in the center, patient along with that and the uh, palliative care and the last resort is for the patient to reach the hospital, but yes, it is still an option, as far as the patient is comfortable, the bottom line is patient comfort. Rajam, there are two questions that I uh, that perhaps you could help with. One is yes. from uh, Zaveh Chaudhary, who asked the question earlier. If we could have a list of palliative care specialists in our country, city-wise, of people. There's another question which is there, which is a little more specific. Uh, and this person has said, please do not reveal my identity. 
my older brother shows early signs of dementia i'm very worried about him as he and his wife live alone in pune are there any groups that we could think they can approach for help the doctor is in mumbai and so not available for uh, for for immediate support so the indian association of palliative care on the website has city wise doctors i must say even now the focus is a lot on malignancy but the principles of care for malignant and non malignant conditions are the same so they will get some doctors the other way to approach this is that depending on the city that is involved i mean the person is present you could actually find out the palliative care centers in that particular website now when it comes to pune there are many private as well as uh, there are there is one focus specifically on cancer but for dementia patient there are many private palliative care physicians who have in facilities that is admitting facilities as well as home care visits as well as outpatient clinics so there are pockets of some palliative care presence in tier 1 and tier 2 cities of india what is the problem is that the it is not common knowledge for the general population also i think people are not aware that they can actually go to a doctor and say i want comfort care or i do if there is no cure i want comfort care we haven't evolved to that status even when patients are diagnosed with incurable neurological conditions i'm sure dr roop will agree that a patient with parkinsons or even a patient with another disease called motor neuron it takes a lot of our effort to convince them at lots of sessions so we are not so evolved our the general population is not so mature or read or medically aware to ask for palliative care and this is one of the things we want to drive to the common people that ask for what is best suits you the doctor doesn't know what suits everybody it has to be individualized every human being is unique and every human being's needs are different so you need to know what you need and put it in front of the doctor i know it's intimidating very often doctors are very busy they don't have the time and that is the reason why we need family physicians and we need palliative care physicians who listen to you and who basically say that this is the problem these are the issues and therefore how we can make this more comfortable we can't make it go away we can't we don't have a solution for it but at least we can make the journey bearable and at least they know they have a person to reach out to to share and vent and i think that is a big thing especially if you have a medical a uh, suggestion or a medical intervention at the end of it like say try this or try that have you tried this and i think for a caregiver at that time it's a great help for having some sms or a whatsapp that comes which relieves their stress so uh, uh i think we i as you were speaking i looked at uh, the palliative care in association of palliative care website so this is palliativecare.in which is p a l l i a t i v e c a r e dot in i have also put the uh, the url in, in the chat window so those of you uh, would like to know it you know uh, dr gursani is amazing he is also as you you and you were speaking he is also responding to questions uh, that have come in on the on the q and a so i'm i'm going to but you know uh, read out some of the questions and and read out his answer oh sorry because it's important uh so samuel uh, hail who's been also active in the chat he has said you just mentioned there are just 250 doctors trained in palliative care as of now would you agree that advocacy of palliative care is the need of the hour in our country and uh, 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 dr gosani said we need your support i agree that is what is required uh then there was uh, somebody maria sequera who asked what do you think of atul gavande's uh, uh, on being mortal and he said uh, so I, i i don't agree with his recommendation though he says everybody should receive to read it but he also said the pdf is available for free you should not pay for the book let mr gavande get some royalty and let get the publisher get <laughs> it out. and don't buy the book don't read a pirated copy i would say <laughs> <laughs> it's spoken like an author i suppose sorry <laughs> spoken Journalist. like somebody who writes <laughs> yeah, you know i want you to be writing your writing a book also and you know i want you to be getting the money for it so uh no clearly i think you know as as a policy we 
basically try and advocate uh, uh, legal consumption of of, of 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 books, and 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 we want more and more people to come in uh, and uh, look at uh, uh, writing books so that there is uh, greater learning. Um, we have a question from uh, Arvind uh, uh, Navre who says, "How does one prevent dementia?" Right. So I think I said that a little earlier. And uh, uh, obviously with the brain, uh, uh, the key thing is that if you don't use it, it rusts. Use it or lose it. And actually, it doesn't need you to... Uh, I mean, people talk of learning new skills. and Yeah, that's fine. But the simplest thing still is physical exercise. Simplest and the one that seems to be best documented. In literature and in, in, in the scientific literature. So as I said this earlier, uh, the same circuitry that uh, underlies uh, your thinking also underlies your walking. So if you can force yourself to walk faster, a little faster than you normally would do, 30 minutes twice a day, you're actually using up, sorry, you're actually strengthening the same circuitry. So it's as simple as that. We have a question from a, a very important question. Uh, does Mediclaim take care of palliative care hospitalization? Ah, Rajam, I so, think not. Not yet. Uh, so just to give a little bit of ray of hope, uh, the, the National Cancer Grid has now asked palliative care physicians of the interventions that can be done for cancer patients as a palliative care approach and therefore include it in the uh, for the insurance which comes from the government of India. But I think as of now, a private insurance doesn't look as at palliative care as, so for example, especially when you're having people uh, being cared for at home and you're still spending for the nurse and you're spending for the doctor visits, I don't think that is covered and that can be used, I mean, that is covered by insurance. If you admit the patient in the hospital, then of course it's a different uh, ball game, but not yet. I don't think it is covered yet, but the National Cancer Grid is wanting to include that in the uh, ones who go through this uh, Ayushman Bharat and those kind of things, not yet for the private insurance companies, but it should be because it is also a form of treatment. I just want to reiterate that palliative care is not giving up on the patient. It is really to see to it that the patient is comfortable. So the pharmacotherapies used in palliative care is tweaked in such a way that it is only aimed at patient comfort and reduce suffering. It doesn't mean we don't do anything and watch him suffer or watch him die. It is not giving up. Very, very important. We are pro-life. We want to keep quality of life good till death. And I think there's a lot of misnomer about this. And very often even hospital consultants say, oh, so you're giving up on your loved one. And it really spirals the loved one into an already confused mind saying, oh, I better not listen to this palliative care human being. I better go back to my primary consultant. So I think a lot of myths, we need to start talking about it. And I think I should really thank you, Pradyuman, for providing us this forum to reach out to the common people. The more you read, the more you talk, you can actually clear these confusions. And I think presently, like I said, I think even the last time that we are all such a death denying society that we fear about it more and plan less while we should reverse it and plan about it more and fear less. I think it's very, very important to get the stuff right because it is going to happen to all of us and we can't afford to put it in under the carpet and brush it under the carpet yeah so, so when, when you have a uh, a doctor like uh, dr gursani here there are a few questions that have come in for which are non palliative care related which i want to ask you but before that we have a comment in the chat window from uh, yashna rajani who says i'm a daughter of a patient with als of dr roop and have had some conversations with Dr. Rajam also. I think the journey is still on, but it is surely helping us each day. All thanks to sir's regular support and handholding and appropriate guidance. There were things suggested at the right time and, that, and I think that is helping my father to spend his limited time in a happy manner. So salute to you know both of you for, uh, for doing that. I think that's what is important. And the whole thing of care and cure is, 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 is so important. We have a couple of questions, uh, 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 Dr. Ayer, I'm going to indulge 
uh, here because this is, uh, uh, you know, somebody has said it's a very urgent and very, very important question. So, um, sorry, can I just interrupt here for this, sorry, this insurance thing? That question was not, uh, uh, okay, so some of you may be aware that uh, in the United States, which is uh, where everything is done through insurance, uh, you have something like uh, called Medicare. Okay, so everybody in the United States is entitled to get hospice care, which means care in the last six months of life, which is provided by insurance. I mean, private insurance companies, but that is underwritten by the state. So if, if at a certain point, your doctor decides that you probably have six months or less, and they put you on that, then the government makes sure that the insurance, that it is provided. It's provided by private insurance companies, but the government pays for it. So hopefully, we should also end up reaching that stage at some time. But that will require a fair amount of work from uh, all of us. Right. So I, 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 I really hope that happens because I think it's, it's an issue that, you know, we must all try and push and achieve for, uh, for, for an important, uh, you know, facet of, uh, of medical treatment. So there's this question from, uh, from JK Chen who says, I've had a stroke. I'm suffering from uh, paralysis since the last six months and have tingling in my hands. I've shown it to specialists in Capita. They have suggested me vitamin B12 and other medicines, but they are of no use. Kindly let me know why there is this tingling and suggest a treatment. <laughs> so, okay, so Rube, you want uh, to go first? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll just answer that. I'm sorry to hear about your problem, but uh, uh, basically, the ways we in which we handle. Uh, a complaint like this is with good physiotherapy and with the uh, drugs which are called drugs which work on something that we call neuropathic pain. So there are multiple drugs available. There's uh, a drug called gabapentin, there's a drug called pregabalin, there's a drug called amitriptyline, nortriptyline. So there's a there's at least about four, five drugs and what needs to be done is to uh, sensitively adjust them uh, I'm not saying that it will be completely cured or the whole thing will just go away. But uh, to make sure that you have the best possible relief with the least possible side effects. But that requires somebody to actually adjust your medications. And all I would like to add is, I think, again, a proper evaluation and maybe a joint consultation with another pain or palliative care specialist and your neurologist can actually get down to this. Because we also need to explore if there's anything else contributing to it. For example, the sugars, for example, something else that can be adjusted to decrease the tingling numbness. So I think just a revisit to your full medical history and a complete thorough examination, along with these medications that Dr. Roop has suggested with discussion with your primary physician will really help. And I think an intervention with the pain, see, because I think such as complaint automatically triggers your thought process and then you're constantly worried about it. So a holistic approach to any complaint, actually the, you know, like how we describe in palliative care as the total pain of a patient. It's not just physical. It's physical is the top of the iceberg. The rest, the thought process, the spiritual, the financial is all at the bottom, which really needs to be tapped and explored. And I think it does make a difference. Like Dr. Roop said, we can't make it all go, but at least we can address it and acknowledge the presence and maybe make the intensity less. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a chat that has come in from Prabhat Krishna. And, and this is not really seeking advice. This is about treatment for Parkinson's. Uh, she says most neurosurgeons or neurologists advise Sindopa or Sindopa Plus, which have side effects. People are normally unaware of the of the dosage. Doctors keep telling the patient we'll be able to walk properly soon. This has never happened. I've seen many patients all have gone from bad to worse. Due to chemical imbalance, multiple situations arise. People become schizophrenic and start behaving abnormally. The treatment never ends. As I have taken care of my late husband who passed away recently, I went strictly by the doctor's advice, which had become hard to manage financially and emotionally. Under these conditions, uh, could the uh, advice be given to the family uh, uh, members properly? This is my request. Okay, so 
Parkinsonism again is one of those conditions which uh, palliative care has a role. Um, what people don't realize is that 85 to 90 percent of Parkinson's is the standard form. It's called we call it idiopathic Parkinsonism. Okay, which responds to medications for a fairly long period of time, sometimes for as long as 15, 20 years, but more and more side effects start appearing, as you mentioned, for Leodopa. And once that appears, then there are other treatments that are possible, uh, some that are, I mean, these are medical decisions about uh, which treatments can be used and the age of the patient and so on. And uh, with that, we believe that uh, people with Parkinsonism uh, in this current day and age should be able to live out almost their entire lifespan. Okay. I'm not saying that uh, uh, things will not be difficult towards the end. They will. But we can try and minimize that as much as possible. This is as far as idiopathic Parkinson's disease or uh, uh, what has also been called Parkinson disease. Okay, that's what that is concerned. But there is uh, about 10 to 15 percent of people with Parkinsonism which have what we call the Parkinson plus syndromes. Now, the Parkinson plus syndromes are conditions where, in addition to Parkinson's, the original Parkinson uh, uh, disease, there's other stuff that is going on in the brain. The brain is degenerating in other parts as well. So obviously, these are patients who have multiple other symptoms. They have, uh, you know, very often they have uh, dementia. So you have a combination of something like Alzheimer's and they may have behavioral problems. So it's not really schizophrenia. It's the behavioral, we call them BPSD, behavior, behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia, which start off in people with Parkinson's. So again, uh, you need... Uh, a fair amount of, uh, uh, I would say, orientation to be able to manage that. For much of this, you will be able to access people who are specialized in movement disorders. Uh, I'm a neurologist. I don't, uh, in that sense, specialize in movement disorders, though, of course, I treat uh, Parkinson's. But there are, I think, about seven, eight of them in Mumbai itself, and uh, they uh, do a good job. So, you can you can help people with Parkinson's lead fairly good lives till fairly late in the illness. And uh, um, I think one thing that everybody needs to understand is that as medicine evolves, as medical science evolves, uh, if you are somebody who can afford a bit, if you're educated, if you read up, if you do a little bit of research, it's actually up to you. Uh, accessing care is, is up to you. And uh, uh, you can't say Ki, doctor ne ye kara, doctor ne wo kara. Nahin. You you are, I look on my patients and the families as partners. It's not like I'm on top of them and I'm going to tell them ye karo or wo karo. Nahin, I can't. I think what is the difference, Dr. Roop, is that most neurologists are not like you. So I, what I'm trying to say is our training is not focused in that sense. So if you have a patient neurologist who has, hasn't told this to the family, it becomes difficult for the person or the caregiver to take a unilateral decision by reading and research. They're scared to upset their doctor. They're scared to confront their doctor and they probably either end up shopping and meet similar kind of doctors. So I think the whole problem also comes from the fact that somewhere as a caregiver that I have been, I also feel that as a caregiver, you feel that if A doctor is saying, ye karo, wo karo, wo karo, and if B doctor is saying, kuch mat karo, naturally as a human psychology, you want to keep doing things because you don't want to let go. The point is how you explain to the patient at what stage you explain to the patient and prepare the patient in the family. And I think that is what is lacking in our, the conversation. For example, I, four years ago, never told a COPD patient or an interstitial lung disease patient, Ki, let's talk about this. This is going to happen to you. We are going to do this, this, this. And in an emergency, what would you do? I never spoke about all that. So I myself can see the change that this whole teaching and learning has come. And therefore I feel 
we have to change we have to come halfway and our people need to start asking what is the other option what can i do to myself be more comfortable as well as the patient see in our country also care giving is thought to be this such a larger of life this whole thing of you being this um, duty you have to be with this great uh, daughter or son of course you have to look after your father look of course you should not be complaining and therefore even if you find somebody saying look i'm not able to cope that also comes across very surprising and i know i have looked down on people saying are why are you complaining you a father would have done the same thing to you if you were younger but the point is it's not the same situation and i think everybody needs to understand a little bit not be judgmental and biased about how people are looking after their loved ones and i think the loved ones don't have that kind of empowerment to say i can't do this what am i doing i am not coping they are okay to suffer and look after the loved one sit next to the hospital beds covid not covid so i think the whole system is such dr ru very few neurologists understand this as partners everybody all the doctors you know so many doctors we deal together who are on their high horses it is my way or the highway so it is difficult for a common person from the community to actually say look i can't do this is there any other option because then I, he probably think that doctor is gone for life he'll have to go and look for another doctor so i think it's it's the system has to change it has to be both ways because i think tomorrow we will become patients and we we will we will end up having to see such doctors who are so autocratic so it is yep. scary therefore we need to teach the next generation to be a bit like have some palliative care hat on there are a couple of interesting uh, observations and questions that have come in but i'm going to come to you uh, uh, dr gosani once again there's a uh, there's someone who said he is uh, says his name is ashok kapoor age 67 plus his right hand shakes while holding anything slightly weighty like a cup of tea however his left hand is fine it started about 20 years back and still remains the same his question is is it related to a neurological problem or is it normal at this age and it is treatable this is uh, ashok kapoor who is 67 plus okay i uh, again i mean uh, very specific medical questions so uh, to be very honest is are something that need to be answered by a Uh, a doctor's consultation so wherever you are i suggest you ask a neurologist to take a look at you but if it has been going on for 20 years um well it will go on for another 20 years so i wouldn't worry too much about it frankly but uh, this particular kind of tremor what you're describing is called essential tremor and uh, it may run in families sometimes it does get worse with age and in a small number of people it actually does overlap with parkinsonism so that is why you need a uh, neurological checkup but uh, i wouldn't frankly i mean if it's been around for 20 years i wouldn't get terribly worried about it okay thank you you know there are a couple of observations that have come in on which i must end end this thing with is there are uh, zavier chaudhary says there are very few doctors like you both thank you for all you do uh, and uh, there is an anonymous attendee who says what made the two of you take up this herculean task herculean discomforting task of being involved in palliative care um you want to go first ru <laughs> yeah so i know you know some time ago i mean this was quite a while ago i seem i i began to become very uncomfortable with the idea that i was stuck with patients where i would say ab main kuch nahi kar sakta it hurts and uh, you know uh, uh, a series of coincidences and i and palliative care suddenly popped up as a possibility uh, i mean if 10 years ago you had asked me what palliative care was i would not have been able to explain it and uh, as it popped up and as i learned the basic skills and i realized that i didn't need to become a palliative care physician the way rajam is i just needed to learn enough to be able to use those skills in my regular practice and it made life really emotionally easier for me uh i don't know if you see uh, rajam and i we we uh, we are we are generally fairly i think we are fairly humorous i mean we enjoy life <laughs> but uh, that's what uh, to some extent palliative care has helped us in doing we are not it's i call it my burnout vaccine it makes sure that i am not going to go 
I'm this big doctor. Talk nicely to me. No, it it takes care of that. As far as I'm concerned. I think I have shared my reason for getting into palliative care in the past. So briefly, it's a personal bereavement. Uh, the way I lost my father, and I realized that as a doctor, I needed support when he was unwell, and support in the sense constantly for the time he was unwell, and that made me think that if I was such a wuss. imagine non medical people would be absolutely petrified as to what decisions to take and i think they end up coming to the casualty or to the hospital and then doctors just use the patients as a conveyor belt from one thing to the other to the icu to the ventilator even when there was no medical uh, indication and it was probably futile to do that aggressive treatment and my mantra i think like roop said um well there are days when i say oh god there's so much suffering in this world and this that and the other but having dealt with patients and families who go through so much immense uh, trauma and suffering i think i've started respecting life and living much better i think all of us know that we are going to die and therefore make the most of the day you have if you're able to walk run laugh watch movies do everything you can in a day and i think i have started respecting life and living much more because of the fact it's not at all morbid even when you manage to be the voice of that dying person who is not able to speak anything and kind of be uh, even virtually be a hand holder for a family going through that those difficult times days hours weeks it speaks volumes and i think that's what keeps me going like i think small things like even um, i think zavier just commented it just feels good and it's not anything with uh, expecting shabashi or accolades it just feels good at the end of the day that you manage to keep one person comfortable and i think that's is the most important thing to keep going so do you want to tell the uh, starfish story or so you can you know yeah so one of the things that uh, we always worry about in palliative care is mai itne sare log hain mai kuch nahi kar sakta so mai ek se bhi nahi shuru karunga so the starfish story is uh it's you look and look it up it's it's called the starfish story uh, man walking along a beach and as he walks along he sees a little boy in the distance throwing something into the water and as he walks uh there are starfish you know the starfish they are stranded the tide has put them on the beach and this boy is running frantically up and down the beach throwing starfish into the water back into, back into the water and the man walks past him then comes back and says ye tum kya kar rahe ho he says i'm saving them so he says there are so many how can you do this the little boy picks up a fish throws it says uske liye to main khana so for all of us in medicine we have to literally look at it that way i cannot do everything but wherever i'm there i should do the best i can thank you very much you know i i have a i have a take away from this whole thing and the last session that i that we had you uh, and sujeet uh, uh, rajan their doctor uh, and uh, the session today is that yes there is a genuine worry you know, when a person goes to the doctor the the thing is that you know you hand over your life and body to the doctor and uh, but but the session that we've had today with you as well as uh the last time has shown that there are some chinks that exist and that there is a need for uh you know the x factor of uh, palliative care and people who are looking at this so i'm really delighted that uh that you know both of you are here and since we are uh, uh we are seniors today and we are uh, uh we have host of senior citizens who are present and you know i i shouldn't idly be doing that but i must say that you know if those of you who have uh god forbid some issues with uh any neurological concerns you know who to go to because at the end of the day what you are looking for as someone who requires um uh, quality health care is a doctor who understands and who has you know who, who has the cure as well as who's looking at the care and that's what is important and and you know i i'm i'm really delighted and i'm so happy that we are doing this session uh, uh today and you know i've i've uh, 
got you uh, rajam to agree to do it uh, more regularly and with looking at various other uh, concerns that that exist but uh, thank you very much for your time on this saturday evening uh, uh, thank you dr roop gosani for for your time and dr raja bayer for um, for intermittently for being present <laughs> for intermittently being present yeah that's But also i just want to just add on one thing and like roop said we don't really need to all become specialists in palliative care i think all doctors trained just need to have know when to switch on to their palliative care hat to know there's something else that this patient needs and immediately address that and maybe the further greater referral can go to a specialist palliative care team but like and also uh, the other beauty of palliative care is not just doctors it is nurses it is paramedics it is common people like i've said before also a person who's looked after a stroke patient can be a great teacher to another patient who is going to be looking after his or his or her own father so the volunteers they yeah. they do a wonderful job too so it's a multi we need volunteers team. absolutely and somebody who's looked after their mother or father for 5 years 6 years or 5 months can actually be a great source of help for us we can say you contact this person he or she will help you how to change the human being how to look after a bedridden and simple practical tips that probably even doctors don't know because we've not done it hands on we've not looked after every condition hands on so it's important for all of us to be aware that we can do much more in small ways to look after our patients and our loved ones and improve their care experience and i think uh, that's the most important yes roop so one more thing to add and this is something that i'd meaning be meaning to bring up and that is what uh, uh, is the importance of support groups right so yes. we need support groups for conditions for instance uh, um, uh, yashna is here so uh, there's a als support group Uh, and then they do a wonderful job of you know supporting each other helping out with uh, information and so on uh, there's another one which has come up for uh, the difficult parkinsons what i called parkinson plus and we need uh, similar support groups for other conditions where families and patients can actually help each other i mean with doctors of course being there to provide medical information when required but we need people to organize themselves absolutely and i you know if there's any way in which seniors today can can help uh, you know we will uh, uh, those of you who would like to uh, you know send us a message and say that you are available for support we'll be happy to post this uh, in our uh, in, in some way we have not i i don't have a ready answer as to how we are going to be doing it but you know we'll be happy to uh, to have some kind of a bulletin board or whatever where we can put up these uh, uh uh and and we have a person who's already come yashna rajani has said i am happy to help in any way uh i'm a speech language pathologist so great thank you once again you know this has been our longest ever session we are we started at 5 and we are now at uh, uh 6 uh, 20 so uh thank you very much for your time and uh, uh you know for for those of you who are here thank you for joining in uh the takeaways uh, from this session will be on seniors today dot in on monday morning and uh, uh, as will be the edited video from this session so uh, do refer to uh, uh, seniors today dot in on uh, monday morning it will be there in the webinar section in case you are not able to log in on on monday morning and we'll be back once again uh, next saturday at 5 pm with uh, uh, our next session of health time thank you once again thank you so much thank lovely you. to be here even thank though i was there not there for half the time see you thanks roop and all of you stay thank safe you. and please get vaccinated bye yes.